Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you today. I was very sorry to miss St. Patrick's Day here last week in Boston. I did manage to get to the Pontifical Irish College in Rome for a great meal with the Irish community there. No corned beef, our usual Seder meal here in Boston. The food on the plate was unidentifiable, but it was green, <laughs> orange, and white. <laughs> the whole pre-conclave atmosphere there where I was leading in the Italian polls <laughs> was quite surrealistic. I thought of St. Patrick, who was from a Roman family living in Britain. Patrick, as we know, was an Irish wannabe. He was actually an Italian kidnapped by Irish pirates. And I was worried that the Italians were trying to get even. <laughs> actually, I was very touched by the Italian people's enthusiasm for your archbishop. Needless to say, I am very happy and relieved to be home in Boston. The whole experience of the conclave was extraordinary. I felt very close to all of you. I knew that we were united in prayer, praying that the Holy Spirit guide our church in this important decision like those first Christians praying intensely before choosing St. Matthias to be an apostle, to fill the vacancy and pass on the office. We were all delighted that for the first time in history, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople was present for the inaugural mass. And the patriarch Bartholomew has even invited Pope Francis to come with him to the Holy Land to mark the 50th anniversary of that historic visit between Pope Paul VI and the Patriarch Athenagoras. By the same token, the presence of His Eminence Metropolitan Methodius here today is one more sign of the growing hope for our churches to be reunited. One of my favorite books in the New Testament is St. Luke's Acts of the Apostles, which has been called the Gospel of the Spirit. Acts highlights the ministries of St. Peter and St. Paul, but the real protagonists of this book of the New Testament are the Holy Spirit and the community of faith. It's a book of frenetic action amid constantly shifting scenes, conspiracy and intrigue, hostile confrontations and fierce conflicts, rioting, lynching mobs, and incessant missionary journeys all over the Medi Mediterranean world, complete with shipwrecks, venomous serpents, chains and imprisonments, and at least two successful prison breaks, famine, an earthquake, crime and punishment, and powerful sermons, all guided by the Holy Spirit, who was poured out on those first Christians at Pentecost. In our Greek classes in the seminary, the old German friar who taught us stressed how St. Luke used the most literary classical forms and the most elevated style for the Acts of the Apostles but that the way Acts ends so abruptly is quite a departure from the literary construction of the rest of the book. There are several plausible explanations. Luke may have died, leaving the work unfinished. Amazon may have canceled his contract. <laughs> or, as I like to believe, he meant that the Acts of the Apostles never really ended and that now we are the cast of characters and the Holy Spirit is leading us in these turbulent times. 
Certainly for me, the conclave was a Pentecost experience right out of the Acts of the Apostles. Catholics all over the world were united in praying for the church, the cardinals, and the conclave so that the Holy Spirit would guide us. I have no doubt that all our prayers were answered. In the Gospels, Jesus is always seeking those at the periphery and bringing them center stage. By having a pope from the Southern Hemisphere, the church is doing that. The strongest growth and vitality among our over one billion Catholics in the world is in the Southern Hemisphere. I am sure that Pope Francis will be a great stimulus and encouragement to our brothers and sisters in those parts of the world. And soon half the Catholics in our own country will be Hispanics as well. I'm also convinced that Pope Francis' unswerving devotion to the poor and the social gospel of the church will also touch the hearts of many in the secularized countries of Europe and North America and help them to see the church in a new light. Here in Boston, we must see ourselves as a continuation of the church of the Acts of the Apostles. With so many dramatic challenges, we must cultivate a deep trust in the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and unite us. As we work to implement the pastoral plan, it cannot be just about strategy or techniques, but about our own deep awareness of God's loving presence in our church. All of our discussions and planning, like the work of the pre-conclave congregations and the conclave itself, need to take place in that atmosphere of prayer and trust in God's love for us. Likewise, he and the archdiocese are thrust toward the new evangelization and the pastoral plan, disciples and mission, must be realized in an atmosphere of prayer and discernment with a profound trust in the presence of the Spirit to guide the church. The Spirit acts where there is prayer and unity, and the Spirit enables us to pray and overcome all of our differences so that like at Pentecost, we can all hear the wonderful things of God, each in his or her own language. I am grateful to all the pastors of the parishes of phase one, who with great faith and generosity have entered into the planning process, making sacrifices for the sake of the greater good. As my brother Cardinals and I entered the conclave, we didn't know what the outcome would be or what the future would hold. We were called to make ourselves available for the mission of the church. Our pastors in the first phase of pastoral planning have likewise been called to make themselves available for mission without knowing what the outcome would be as once again they responded oddsum. The Archdiocese is greatly blessed by their dedication, commitment, and example of selfless service as we embark on the journey of rebuilding our parishes and welcoming faithful back to active participation in the life of our church. We want our planning process, like the conclave in Rome, to be a Pentecost moment in this year of faith. In this context, I would like to reflect for a moment on the Catholic priest as a man of faith. Today we come together as a presbyterate who have a special connection to Christ and to one another. Pope Benedict, our Pope Emeritus, and an extraordinary teacher of the faith, has given us this year of faith. O Benedict always relates faith and joy. The deeper our faith, the more that we will experience the joy of being Christ's disciple and friend. Pope Paul VI used to say, 
that more than teachers, the world needs witnesses. Yes, the church needs us to be joyful teachers and witnesses of the Catholic faith. The fact that the year of faith marks the anniversary of two great events, the Second Vatican Council and the publication of the Catechism, underscores the importance of the content of faith. It is of great importance that we be able to understand the rich teachings of the Vatican Council in the context of an hermeneutic of continuity that can help the church to teach the gospel in the contemporary world without being cut off from the taproot of our tradition. The catechism is also a very valuable tool to teach the doctrines of the faith and demonstrate how they are interrelated and present a coherent vision that forms a pattern for a way of life. Understanding the content of faith is important in order to have that vision that allows us to lead a life of faithful discipleship. The priest, as a man of faith, must be a student. Our ongoing formation is a crucial aspect of our priestly life. There is a direct correlation between neglecting ongoing formation and pastoral burnout. Our ability to preach with confidence and enthusiasm, our capacity to help our people understand complex ethical issues, our creativity in organizing the pastoral life of our parishes, our appreciation for the liturgy and its execution are all affected by our commitment to ongoing formation or the lack of it. Once again, the success of our pastoral planning is conditioned by our commitment as priests to our ongoing formation. We cannot tell ourselves we do not have time. Neglecting our continuing formation will cause great detriment to the pastoral life of our church and to our own lives as priests and ministers. In the first instance, the priest must be a man of faith means that Christ is the priest's best friend. In the Gospels, the Greeks go to the apostles and they say, we want to see Jesus. Our people want to see Jesus in us. They want to know that Jesus is our best friend. In our compassion, understanding, and self-sacrifice, in our lives of obedience, of chastity, of generosity, they want to glimpse the Good Shepherd who has laid down his life for them. To be such a man of faith means having a real interior life, prayer, reflection on the Scriptures, and an annual retreat that is a serious time of introspection are all essential for our life and ministry. It also means acts of penance, making sacrifices out of love for God and a desire to make reparation for our own sins. It means making use of the sacrament of reconciliation as a path of ongoing personal conversion. Our friendship with Christ is inexorably bound to our vocation to be men of the Eucharist. Archbishop Sarton wrote a very moving letter to his priests, urging them to say Mass each day. He says, as a husband kisses his wife with affection each morning, so a priest should kiss the altar every day. This is a very public gesture in the presence of those gathered for the Eucharist but at the same time an intensely private gesture, an act of affection and surrender, an act of love and trust. Even more to the point, the priest's kissing of the altar is an act of identification. He is proclaiming to Christ, to himself and to his parishioners, that it is Christ the high priest who makes him who he is. We kiss that altar as a sign of the Lord himself, 
the sacrifice of Calvary and the table of the Last Supper. Everything we do flows from the altar and back to it. The kiss symbolizes our daily embrace of the sacrifice of Christ as our way of life. For on the day of our ordination, we were totally and irrevocably joined to Christ, our High Priest. In the Latin rite, we begin the Eucharist by kissing the altar. At the end of every celebration of the Eucharist, the Maronite priests pray a beautiful prayer that is a farewell to the altar. They pray, Remain in peace, O holy altar of God. I hope to return to you in peace. May the offering I have received from you forgive my sins and prepare me to stand blameless before the throne of Christ. I know not whether I will be able to return to you again to offer sacrifice. Guard me, O Lord, and protect your church, that she may be the way to salvation and the light of the world. I was once at the funeral of a Maronite priest. His brother priest carried his body around the altar, reciting this prayer of farewell to the altar. It was a very moving sight and a reminder to celebrate each Mass as if it were our last. As priests, our love for the Mass and Eucharistic devotion are what nurture our friendship with Christ and our priestly identity as men of faith and best friends with Christ. The priest as a man of faith is to be a teacher of the faith. There is so much illiteracy in today's world. Our service as preachers and teachers of the Catholic faith is crucial for the life of the church. In today's secularized culture, we must prepare ourselves to be able to explain the faith. The book I sent you at Christmas, Defending the Faith Without Raising Your Voice, is a wonderful primer on a way to broach the difficult topics that confront us and that at time cause people to become estranged from the church. In our parishes, we are head catechists and need to prepare and encourage those who help us in the responsibility of teaching the faith. We must realize that questions left unanswered can lead to doubts. Our people do have a desire to know the faith and to understand the Eucharist. I often comment that how our young couples attending the marriage preparation programs have consistently said that their favorite part of the weekend was the teaching mass. An important part of the new evangelization is teaching the faith. For us, that begins with the Sunday experience. We must make the Sunday Eucharist central in our efforts to grow the parish. In his book, Rebuilt, Father Michael White describes his frustrating efforts to revitalize Nativity Parish in Baltimore, where all of the surveys reveal that what the parishioners liked most about the parish was that it had great parking. Father White tried a hundred different programs, greatly overburdening himself and his staff with very little results. He finally became very angry. He describes that as his Popeye movement. That, that moment allowed him to break out of the doldrums. His cry became, it's the weekend, stupid. And he began to concentrate on the Sunday liturgy the music, the children's liturgy, the preaching, and then things really began to happen. The Eucharist is our best resource to teach the faith and build a community. If the Eucharist is the core of our own identity, we will be able to kindle Eucharistic amazement in the hearts of our people. The priest, as a man of faith, is a witness to the faith. Our new Holy Father, Pope Francis, has underscored for us the church's preferential option for the poor. The priest must be a father to his people. 
but in a very special way, a father to the poor. In Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, the old bishop, Monseigneur Bienvenu, refuses to denounce Jean Valjean, who just abused his hospitality by stealing the bishop's silver candlesticks. When the police drag Jean Valjean back to the bishop's house, the old bishop, rather than denounce the thief, gives the convict the rest of his silver. That act of mercy causes a conversion in the hardened convict's heart. In the film Ryan's Daughter, the pastor in an Irish village is the constant companion of a mentally retarded man treated as the village idiot. And the same pastor bravely protects a woman accused of collaborating with the enemy for falling in love with a British officer. But we don't have to turn to the world of art to see in our priests God's love for the poor. It was a great moment for all of us on that Monday morning last December when the front page of the Boston Globe featured one of our own priests, Father Doc Conway, a Catholic priest reaching out to the people entrusted to his care. In our inner cities, in our neighborhoods, in our suburban communities where families live that have been upended by protracted recession, in outreach to missions to Haiti and throughout the world, responding to the homeless and the hungry at our doors. Every day, the priests of the Archdiocese of Boston witness Christ's presence to people in need. Our love for the poor is never just philanthropy. It is rather evangelical poverty that inspired St. Francis to kiss the leper, to give all his wealth to the poor, to see Lady Poverty as freedom from the shackles of wealth. In the context of faith, embracing the spirit of poverty is an expression of humility, seeking the last place at table to be nearer to Christ who has come to serve and wash our feet. As priests, we are called to a simplicity of lifestyle that allows us to be free, unencumbered by expensive toys and hobbies. We are called to detachment that allows us to recognize the poor and the suffering as an icon of the crucified Lord, as a manifestation of his presence in our midst. I am confident that Pope Francis's love for the poor and his passion for the social gospel will help galvanize the church to a greater fidelity to the gospel and a renewed commitment to building a civilization of love. In the mission statements of our collaboratives and parishes, we must show our living faith by our commitment to serve the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, the immigrant, and the stranger. St. James tells, tells us, faith without works is dead. The priest, as teacher of the faith and father of the poor, must show our people that the Eucharist is the source of our strength for mission. Our service to the poor must be humble, not self-congratulatory. It must be the normal outgrowth and expression of a faith community. We do these works of mercy, caring for the poor and needy, because we are Catholics, and that's what we are supposed to do. I often reflect on that occasion in the Gospel where Jesus takes his disciples to the temple to be able to po point out to them that poor widow who is dropping a penny into the collection basket. Jesus doesn't say anything to the woman. He doesn't give her her money back. He simply wants his disciples to see and appreciate the faith and the generosity of that poor widow. Once as a young priest, I was unvesting after mass in the sacristy when a young Bolivian lad came in and he handed me a hundred dollar bill. That was the first time that had ever happened in my parish. I said, what is this? He explained that he had found it in the parking lot. I was very surprised that there would be a hundred dollar bill in our parking lot. I knew the boy and his family. 
I had just recently baptized his little sister, Shirley, who was a Down syndrome child. Their father had recently abandoned the mother and five children who were undocumented immigrants and living in deplorable conditions. I went out and spoke with the mom, Anita, who was waiting with the other children. I said, Anita, do you have any money? She said, no, Father. Actually, I came to Mass with five dollars to buy food, but the gospel today was about the widow's might, so I decided to put it in the collection. I gave Anita the hundred dollar bill, and I said, I think God wants you to have this, and if anyone shows up looking for their hundred dollars, I'll take care of it. Needless to say, no one ever came. So many good people in our midst in our parishes, in our communities, live hand to mouth. Many people who but a few years ago never thought they would be faced with shortfalls and providing the basic needs for their families, including many living in the leafy suburbs, are on the verge of insolvency following years of unemployment and discouragement. We are called to grow in our awareness of our brothers and sisters' needs and determine how we, as a faith community, can help them. The little ones and those in need are the protagonists of the Good Shepherd's gospel of mercy. Finally, the priest is a man of faith in a community of faith that is built on relationships. First and foremost is our relationship with Christ, which is both friendship and of a sacramental character. Our priesthood also connects us with each other. The very ordination rite ritualizes the bond that unites all of us as priests. After the bishop imposes hands on the ordinand, all of the priests present come forward and impose hands. And likewise, the priests come forward to extend the greeting of peace to the newly ordained. This was done for each of us, and each of us has done it for other priests. Likewise, the vow of respect and obedience binds the priest not only to the bishop, but also binds him to his fellow priests. Today in the Chrism Mass, we are all united in the blessing of the oils that become our tools in our shared administration of the sacraments. The task of evangelization is advanced by our unity or hindered by the lack of it. As we renew our priestly vows today, let us ask the Good Shepherd to make us one in our priesthood. Let us be joined in an intentional presbyterate that will allow us to be of one heart and one mind as we strive together to be men of faith, priests of Jesus Christ. And may Mary, the mother of the divine shepherd, help us all to be priests after Christ's own heart and give us a special love for the poor, the suffering, the sinner, the outcast, the forgotten. May they see in us a father, a brother, a Catholic priest.